after so many facts and so much erudition, I'm clearly here to balance the ticket. Hello, I'm Llewellyn King. I'm executive producer and host of White House Chronicle on PBS. 1973, I founded a publication called The Energy Daily. It's still going. I published it for 33 years, then I sold it. Uh, so I'm seeped in it. You know, it's, it's been my life for 40 plus years. I am a journalist, and it's generally believed we don't require facts except to support pre conditioned attitudes. But I do know quite a bit about Washington. I've been writing about nuclear power in Washington for um, nearly 50 years, not quite, and I am one of the few people who actually knew Alvin Weinberg. I also saw, uh, at that time, thorium get pushed out by the atomic establishment of the day. Uh, in the 60s, there was enough room for every nuclear idea. There was an enormous enthusiasm for nuclear. There was great excitement. And if you had some different scheme, like a gas-cooled reactor, you weren't encouraged, but there was room. The atomic establishment consisted of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, which directed the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, which had its way in everything. The Joint Committee was different from any other organ of the Congress, any other committee, because it was a joint committee that could introduce legislation. None other ever has, and it's an experiment which will not be repeated. The result was it was a kind of world of its own. It had its own secret, or not terribly secret, but fairly secret offices in the capital itself. That, that was quite unusual. And the people who worked for it, people who were on it, were devoted to nuclear. But they had their own view of it. And it didn't matter whether the Senate was in charge or the House was in charge. And there was no separation between the parties. One of the people, by the way, on the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy was Al Gore's father, who was just as passionately pro-nuclear. The players and names are now sort of lost in history. John Pastore from Rhode Island. Chet Hollerfield, the very powerful House member, also chairman of the Government Operations Committee in the House. Um, and the opposition was very gentle indeed. Uh, Craig Hosmer, who led the opposition mostly from the House side, uh, he had gone to Congress for the sole purpose. He was a uh, congressman from Long Beach, California, for the sole purpose of being on the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy and working on nuclear power. Because of this setup, this establishment, it didn't let a lot of things that it did not approve happen. And it had a rather jaundiced view of gas, of thorium, of any kind of reactor other than light water reactors in the two known kinds, pressurized and boiling water reactors. The role of the Westinghouse Corporation was quite large too. Westinghouse executives were very close to this uh, committee. Um, their yacht would come up the Potomac River. Every year there would be a party on board. The, the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy would sit on the stern of the boat and uh, it was really quite feudal. There was a lot of dispute in the newspapers, a lot of curiosity about who would win the contract to build the Clinch River Breeder Reactor, which was of course never built. And uh, I was said, well, I thought it, uh, thought it was between uh, General Electric and, and, uh, uh, and the Westinghouse Company. And on one of these cruises, I was asking people, who do you think it'll be? He said, see who's sitting next to the chairman. Whose boat are you on? It was the Westinghouse boat. And the uh, reactor chief from Westinghouse, John Simpson, was sitting next to the chairman. And by surprise, they got the contract. Uh, there were lots of formal uh, uh, going through motions, but it was all said. Joint Committee had what m amounted to an industrial policy for nuclear. There would be light water reactors. There would be breeder reactors. We would run out of uh, uranium. There was not a very good sense of how much uranium there was, and fusion would take over. Waste, as they often said, was a de minimis problem. It was going to be put in caverns in Lyons, Kansas, except the caverns leaked, and they had to find another way, another thing to do with waste. They were very arrogant, they were very self-assured, the utilities were going mad to build nuclear power plants, and there was some 
away from light water, there were some really rather bizarre uh, uh, excursions. A tiny little utility called Delmarva, a sort of fingernail along the Chesa, along the Atlantic coast in the mid states, particularly Maryland, um, uh, announced it was going to build 12 gas cooled reactors, which would be constructed by the General Atomic Company of San Diego, 12, and they were going to be, a, uh, I think, 1,200 megawatts each. Incredible order. This was the new world. Of course, it didn't happen. And uh, probably gas and with it thorium uh, really was happily pushed aside when Fort St. Vrain, which was built outside of uh, Denver by uh, the, uh, the General Atomic Company, didn't perform well. And then the establishment got this view that if we do anything except light water, it's, it's like that erroneous idea that some educators have, that you can't teach children more than two languages or one language, particularly British children, they seem to think that. Uh, they're on to us. Um, the, uh, and so it was going to be light water, light water. Well, it's not all over. It's never all over. What is needed is a new approach in Washington and a new approach to the terminology with which the struggle has been fought. The light water industry, the industry we have, uh, is very defensive. It has really, it serves the utilities, not the vendors, not the scientists, not the engineers, but the operators, the utilities. They are in the catbird seat. They control uh, the general view expressed by the nuclear industry, and they're timid. They don't want to say nuclear is better than coal, it's cleaner than natural gas, because they have a lot of sunk investment in coal and because they're buying natural gas very cheaply. They never want to be put in the classic advertising situation of saying, this is better, we are moving ahead, this is superior. So when you come along and you say a Gen 4 reactor is going to be much better, safer perhaps, than previous reactors, this alarms them because of the sunk investment and the fear for the fleet that they have. Anyway, things move on. I have always thought that one of the problems of the utility industry is that it overemphasizes safety in its public statements that it raises the safety issue over and over and over again, so much so that it creates a sense that these reactors are not safe. If I say to you, you know, I'm terribly honest, you know, how we should go into business together, I'm very honest. You wouldn't want to go into business with me, you'd hold your wallet. It's the same psychology, I suspect. We just lost uh, Boeing, uh, Boeing was lost over the Indian Ocean, just disappeared. But Boeing didn't take out a lot of advertisements to say our airplanes are safe. After Fukushima, the Nuclear Energy Institute took out advertisements to say American reactors are safe. Well, the safety argument should be this. If they are not safe, close them down. If they are safe, which I believe and you believe, shut up because you're not helping yourself. I was kind of surprised looking at communication of the AP-1000, how it was extremely technical. As the steam from the in-containment refueling water storage tank fills containment, pressure increases until a certain point is detected by the instrumentation and control system. It didn't seem like it was trying to, uh, to appeal to a mass audience. Then the instrumentation and control system sends a signal to automatically open redundant air-operated valves. They fear if there's any hint that if you say, hey, there's a better reactor here, that this implies that what there is, especially when they mention safety, if you say the AP-1000 is safer than its predecessors, that casts doubt on the predecessors that are still in operation. So they're in a difficult situation. Uh, 
reactors are developed by the vendors, by the, um, they're, but they're bought by the utilities. And utility companies are cautious and by their very nature. They're, they're more, uh, they have to be. And their job is to keep the lights on, not to push the frontiers of science. They tend to want to defend everything that has happened. And they can't do what automobile companies do, which is year after year say that their vehicles are better than they were even though there are millions of their old vehicles running around on the roads. We're just used to that. But if you go out and say there is now a reactor here which is so absolutely superior, so much safer, so much better built, so much this new, improved, incredible, uh, this costs a shadow or it's perceived to cost a shadow over the 100 or 98 reactors that are operating. Is the only thing it takes is one new reactor company to start talking about safety to break that logjam? You know, this is a science that has to have some truth behind it. Uh, you could possibly win it with, say, a thorium reactor. I don't think you can do it if Westinghouse does it with a new light water reactor or General Electric or Siemens or um, uh, um, Arriva or one of the other vendors suddenly that has built lots of these reactors suddenly says this is better than it was i think that would be very awkward and their customers would not like it and their customers are the utilities and utilities want stability they want long life quiet operating systems and machines um, they don't want to be in a wild market of uh, charges allegations and claims that's not their world how do we bring thorium into the game? Well, it's all fought in Washington. And Washington has various things that stimulate it, that push it, that tug it, that move it. They get the body politic to endorse this and to restrict that or to block something else. And I think that it's an opportunity that Washington, and I say Washington in a bi uh, bilateral sense, using, meaning both parties, it's looking for new issues. It's having a very hard time with the issues it has in front of it. And it would really love to fight some elections without those issues. And those issues are immigration, uh, the social issues involving gay marriage, issues like that, which, which are beginning to be a big awkwardness in Washington. How do you then change Washington? Well, you can do it in the time-honored way with lobbyists and basically buying congressmen. Uh, we, we, we call it uh, campaign finance donations. I think they're bribes myself. And it's, what has happened is that in the last 10 years, the rate at which the industry has taken money directly to the Congress uh, bypassing the old need to build up uh, 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 coalitions of media, of public interest, has been left go. It's been straight between the lobbyists, the congressmen, and the contribution. Well, that's changing. Things are difficult. Take the electric utility industry. It's suddenly facing this onslaught of rooftop solar, and the Congress can't help it. The regulators can't help it. So it's a rich time, in a way, to penetrate Washington. Now, how do you do it? There are a few ways of doing it. The front page of the Washington Post, the New York Times, Politico, to a lesser extent, The Hill, and Roll Call, are agendas for action in Washington. They're the source of ideas. Congress people like an idea they can run with that is not too controversial, that won't get them in too much trouble, and is not always bipartisan. The bipartisan madness we have seen since 1994, and uh, Newt Gingrich is coming to Washington to the, to the House, um, is wearing on people. They're fatigued with it. They're also fatigued with the criticism. Nobody likes to have an approval rating of 11%. Even journalists do better than that. We sometimes make it to 15, 16 on good days. Uh, so there, there is an openness. And what you need for Thorium, you need a Charlie Wilson. 
You remember Charlie Wilson. He was a really crazy guy with a very rich girlfriend who was a, a fundamentalist Christian. They made a movie about him, but he got enormous amount of money supporting uh, uh, missionary activities in Afghanistan. Uh, you need somebody to take up your cause and to fight for it. You don't need somebody quite as excessive as Charlie Wilson, but somebody to run with your cause. And how do you get that person? Well, you go to look for them by firing a series of, you hope, silver bullets. Not the great big lobbying attack, but the specific, drop the word thorium, thorium, thorium. The new way, the better way. And you can use safety as a lever. You can say, this is going to be so much safer, an inherently safer reactor. It's something that the light water people ought not to have said, but you can say it. You can use their paranoia, if you will, on them. And you can move the idea that there's an alternative nuclear future forward. Uh, you have one other advantage, rare earths. Congress may not want to listen to anybody who has anything to say about nuclear, but they sure want to listen about rare earths. The two things they know about rare earths is that 97% of them come out of China and that everything that is working today seems to have some rare earths in it. A few well-placed articles will change the entire attitude in Washington. Drop something into the intellectual debate and let it move through it and it will change it the same way that Emory Lovins did when he changed the energy debate with a single article in Foreign Policy magazine. Uh, whatever you think of Emory, and I've known him for a long time and uh, we've had our disputes and we've debated each other all over the place, uh, he did change the debate. The right statement, concise, with a new thought, a concept of something fresh and new and worthwhile is immensely appealing. It's always appealing. Thorium has that chance. And as I like to say, the two things I like to say, one is good things as well as bad things happen. The other one is to quote Lloyd George, who was prime minister during the First World War, the English prime minister, who said, it is dangerous to leap a chasm in two bounds. Thank you.